What's up guys and welcome back. Today we are going to be talking all about the common turn. Uh, first off, we're going to start with the Soviet Union. We're going to talk about their economy and some of their diplomatic actions that they can take. And then we'll finish up with a quick little chat about the CCP. Alright, let's go. Okay, starting off here with the Soviet reference sheet. You'll notice that contrary to the axis, the Soviets only start with 8 of possible 46 IPP income. And that's going to go up as time goes on. I'll explain that in a little bit. Moving on to the overview, I'm going to go over all this stuff on the board and kind of show you some examples. But make sure to read all this very, very carefully. And then obviously you've got your victory points, which you should read on your own time. Now these peacetime income increases are going to go hand in hand with you only starting with 8 of 46 possible IPPs at the beginning of the game. So I'm going to go over these in more detail when I talk about your economy. Keep track of your wartime bonus income. You know, this is going to be super important for you, so read that and keep track of it. And then also with your Soviet special abilities, these are going to be super important to you staying alive when you get attacked by Germany. Uh, these are really, really going to help you out, especially the factory movement and this scorched earth. Now, keep in mind that scorched earth, you can also destroy your own rails to kind of hinder the German advances, so keep that in mind. Moving on to unique units for the Soviets, you've only got one, and that's going to be your Katyusha rocket artillery, which is probably one of my favorite units in the game, so really, really uh, keep track of these. They're going to be super, super cool. All right, let's move on to the board. Okay, let's talk about the Russian economy a little bit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you only start out getting eight IPPs per turn, even though your total IPP land value that you start with is going to be 46. Now that is just to represent that Russia is just coming out of a civil war and not all of their money is going towards their military. So it starts off very, very low, obviously, because the Russians have a little bit more to worry about right now than getting their army up to date. So the Russians start pretty strapped for cash in terms of military units. Now this is going to go up based on actions taken by other powers in the game. Looking here at your reference sheet, you can read all these. For example, every time Japan gets a new land zone adjacent to USSR home country, that's really only going to be Mongolia here. If Japan invades Mongolia, you'll get plus two IPPs to your income. Not this one, this one. And Xinjiang over here, but I don't see Japan actually going that far into China. So really just Russia, you get plus two for each of these territories. So for example, if the Japanese manage to take out Karulin somehow, you'll come right on over here to your income tracker and just move the Russians up to. So now you're getting 10 IPPs per turn as opposed to eight. It's pretty simple. Now moving on, every time Germany or Italy possesses a new land zone adjacent to USSR home country, that's usually going to be Romania over here. Um, sometimes Iran, but probably not. Usually going to be Romania, and you'll just, uh, what it says here is a D12 each time. So what you'll do is you're just going to roll a D12. I got a 9 there. That's a pretty good roll. So what we're going to do is we're going to move our income up to 19. And that's that. And you keep on moving this guy up as you get your income all the way until you hit 46, and that's where it stops for the rest of the game. That is the value of your starting territories in home country. Now, probably the most important one that's going to get you up to that 46 are going to be these two. Your sleeping bear rolls, starting in July of 1939, you just roll a D12 to start of your turn every turn and move up your income by that much. And then obviously if the USSR gets attacked by anybody, they're going to just go straight up to 46 because that's what would happen if somebody got attacked. Now, one other thing to note, in July of 1939, the Soviets can start attacking neutral powers. And so in July 1939, you're usually probably still going to be at 8 unless, you know, something happens and you maybe get a D12 or 2. So given that you're usually gonna be, gonna be at eight and you can start attacking neutrals. So let's say Russia invades Iran on their first turn. Boom. 
Okay, Russia has invaded Iran in July of 1939, and so their economy is going to go up by one IPP. The problem is, if you're still sitting here at 8 and you move this guy up, then now you have to remember that you're not at your wartime income until you get to 47 instead of 46. All right, see how that can get confusing? You have to remember all of the neutral miners that you conquer because you still have to get up 46 for your wartime income. So what I like to do, and this idea is from General Hand Grenade, um, is just use a different roundel to keep track of the neutrals that you capture. So here we've got $1 per turn from Iran, plus our home country IPPs are at eight right now. And as soon as this guy gets up to 46, you've hit your wartime income, and you take this guy off and move this guy to match whatever that was at. Easy peasy. Now it can get a little complicated. Uh, I feel that that is the best way to handle the Soviet economy, uh, else it gets really confusing. That being said, let's talk about Russian diplomacy. It is pretty simple. Um, so starting in July of 1939, the Russians can attack anybody on the map except for CCP. Like, just, they can attack anybody with basically no repercussions. Uh, you know, the Allied income doesn't go up if the Russians attack somebody. So you can pretty much just invade anybody at will. And there aren't any income repercussions to attacking any miner on the board except that the Allied powers cannot attack Russia until such a time that Tokyo or Berlin falls, at which point the Allies may attack Russia, or if Russia attacks a neutral power not adjacent to Russian home country. For example, the popular one down here is going to be Iraq. So Russia can attack Iran or Turkey because it borders our home country and the allies will not be able to, to declare war on them. But if Russia comes here into Iraq, since it doesn't border Russian home country, the allies will be able to, de to declare war on the Russians at any point after that. Now that's basically it for declarations of war and any repercussions that happen because of Russian declarations of war. Next up is just gonna be your alignments. So Tanatube is kind of weird. It just aligns straight up to Russia at the beginning of the game. So as soon as Russia takes its first turn, Tanatuva becomes Russian and you get this militia in here. The only weird thing about this is that since Tanatuva is not in Russian home country, this militia can't actually move out. It's stuck there until you upgrade it into an infantry. Or you can just leave there all game. You know, it's, it's up to you. So no miners align to Russia when attacked by the Allies or the Axis except for Mongolia. I've still got this Japanese roundel here. So if Japan were to attack Mongolia, the rest of Mongolia would align or become a controlled miner of Russia. And that is the only miner in the game that will become a controlled miner of Russia if attacked. Okay, another quirk of Russia is gonna be Soviet-Japanese border clashes. So here on this Japanese-Soviet border here, you can engage in what are called border clashes, which is just one round of combat happens. So say Cheetah is gonna border clash with Northern Manchuria here. This motorized infantry and this militia is gonna take one shot at them at an attack value. And this motorized infantry and this militia is gonna take one shot back at a defense value. They don't cross the border, it takes no movement. It's just one round of combat and they, t and they roll with their attack or defense value. Now these I don't see happen very often because the defender almost always has the advantage, right? So the motorized infantry here is going to be attacking like crap, and he's going to be defending at a four. So I usually don't see very much of that going on, but it is there if you want it to happen. Now there are also a couple of packs that the Russians can sign. They can sign the Molotov Ribbentrop with the Germans, which I didn't talk about in the Germany video. I'm probably not going to talk about here because it, it gets boring when I just read out all stipulations. You know, I'm going to let you read that in the rule book and decide for yourself if you want to sign it. And then there's also this thing called the Japanese Soviet Non Aggression Pact, which just means you can't invade each other here. And if you want to invade, you have to pay three IPPs. 
uh, you just lose three IPPs of the bank, you know, um, and that's that. Uh, I don't see it signed very often just because both powers usually want to keep their options open, but, you know, I'll leave that up to you. If you want to sign it, go ahead. And the last thing we're going to talk about here for the Soviets is going to be Lend-Lease. Now, the Soviets can Lend-Lease to anybody in the game, like literally anybody. You can just Lend-Lease to whoever you want. The Soviets are very, very free in that regard. So what might happen is the French are going to ask you to lend lease to Abyssinia on your first turn because you go before the Italians can attack Abyssinia. You know, that's something that, that may happen. Uh, you can lend lease to the CCP. You know, sh you can lend lease to Germany if they're getting killed by allies and you want to help them out, you know. Or you can lend lease to the allies if, you know, say London's about to fall. I don't know. Uh, you can literally lend lease to anybody. So that's kind of a cool thing about the Soviets. In addition to lend leasing to Abyssinia, the Russians are going to want to lend lease to the Spanish Republicans here pretty much every turn uh, because if the Republicans can win the Civil War, that takes two victory points out of the pockets of the Axis, one for Germany and one for Italy, as well as it's got a lot of point potential for the Republicans as well. Um, and if Spain stays Republican throughout the rest of the game, then that takes a victory point out of French hands too, which is cool. Uh, so the Spanish Civil War is going to be a big deal for the Russians, and they're probably going to be lend leasing over here every turn. And that is basically it, guys, for the Soviets. Let's talk about the CCP real quick. Okay, looking at the CCP reference sheet here, you can see that the CCP starts with a booming economy of two IPPs per turn. You don't have to worry about any peacetime increases because you start the game at war with the mean old KMT down here. A cool thing about the CCP is they start as a controlled miner of the Russians, but if they can get their economy to 13 IPP, so what, seven times your starting income, uh, you evolve to a major power, a fully fledged major power akin to any other in the game, which is, I think, a very, very cool thing. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's pretty sweet. Um, this wartime, wartime bonus income probably only happens after you get attacked by Japan, but it is a big deal for you. Uh, two IPPs per turn is a huge deal for the CCP. At the beginning of the game, the CCP can only build from this build chart, specifically only infantry, militia, cavalry, and mountain infantry. Uh, once you have a land border with the Russians, you can buy artillery and anti-aircraft artillery. So as you can see, the CCP doesn't have a whole lot of attack potential. It's mostly just going to be trying to fend yourself and align some of those warlords and just kind of build up slowly. Once you become a major power, you can build from the full Russian build chart if you have a factory to build units from. Other than that, you just stick with, you know, your, your infantry here. Artillery can only be built in the land zone that borders Russia. So, for example, if it's Xinjiang out here that you finally get, it's going to be way far away from any of the action inside of mainland China. So just remember that artillery can only be built in land zones adjacent to Soviet territory. Now looking here at the CCP special abilities, they've got some really, really cool ones. Uh, you can build units in any territory that you've owned since the beginning of your turn, up to three units. So that's cool. You don't need any factories in China. You can just kind of, you know, put dudes anywhere. Um, since CCP is technically a controlled minor power, it gets a recruitment role. Um, now, you start with one territory, obviously, so good luck hitting those, but you do get a recruitment role, and as you get more territories, that goes up and becomes more common, so the CCP kind of acts as like a, a snowball of sorts in this game. Uh, one really cool thing about the CCP is it gets influence roles every turn. So if you notice here in China, all these roundels are not the same. Um, so these blue ones here are going to be the KMT. That's a controlled miner of the U.S. All these other roundels with the green units on them are called warlords. And the CCP can try to influence them to join their sides. So what you do is at the end of your turn in the place units and collect income phase, you roll a D12, so you choose one of the Warlords, all the round levels are different, see? You choose one of them that you're adjacent to, so at the beginning you can only do Sing Hai or these Northern guys up here. And if you hit the roll on, it's kind of like a recruitment roll, 
you roll for the number of territories you have. So starting off, you're gonna have to hit on a one, which again, good luck. But you can, what you can also do is you can spend IPPs up to the number of territories you have to increase your roll by that amount. So for example, you start off with one territory here, you can spend one IPP to basically add value to that rec recruitment role. So you can spend one IPP and then now you'll hit on a one or a two to influence these warlords. And for example, if you get Tsinghai here and then you have two territories, you can then pay two IPPs to get your roll up to a four or less. So it, it, it goes up pretty quickly. If you can hit these Northern Warlords pretty early, uh, then you, you can spread really, really quickly. It's pretty cool. In terms of diplomacy, at the beginning of the game, you start at war with the KMT. You can declare war on any of the uh, Warlords. Um, I don't recommend it, but you can. Uh, if you declare war on a warlord, it will align to the KMT fully, so you're basically just kind of giving them units if you don't win the attack. And also, you're hurting yourself because you're already at war with the KMT, but, you know, if you feel like you need to do it, go ahead, you can. Uh, once the CCP reaches a major power, which again is very rare, you can declare war on anybody except for the USSR in the game. Uh, so that's something to remember. Now, there is one pact that, that the CCP can sign. If mainland China is attacked by the Japanese, uh, then the KMT and the CCP can sign a truce, which just means that KMT and CCP units can move through each other's territory, which is kind of cool. Um, other than that, not much happens. You can break it anytime. You can still attack each other and break the truce. truce. So really all it means is, is you can freely move units through each other's territory while at war, which... I think this is the only time in the game that that can happen, so it's kind of cool, but obviously you can break it at any time, and it's very, very tenuous. And that's it for the CCP. They start off super weak, but they've got some mean snowball abilities, so they're pretty fun to play. All right, and that's all I got for the Comintern, guys. Stay tuned for the Allied video. See you later.